So we're here at NeurIPS, uh, sitting very cozily around a Canadian campfire. <laughs> uh, and, and I've got the Bengio brothers together, I think possibly for the first time uh, in an interview situation, I'm not sure. Uh, and Joshua Bengio lives in Montreal. Sammy lives in Mountain View, California. Yes. Uh, but uh, fortunately, they're together here today. And I, I have always found it fascinating that there are such prominent brothers in such a rarefied space. Uh, you're probably both some of the most recognized names in machine learning. So. I wanted to hear a little bit about your background. I know you were born in France, mm -hmm. uh, but moved around. Someone told me you spent some time in, in North Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? What did your parents do that took you around the world and, and that sort of thing? Our parents were hippies. Were they really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> no, but seriously. In the 60s, right? Seriously, yeah. they were, yeah. yes. Yeah. And. Um, I think they, they gave us both the interest in science and the humanist values that we've kept and that today in AI are really important. Yeah, yeah. But seriously, they were hippies. I mean, did they, were they academics? No, but for instance, they were in, uh, you know, May, May 68, the yeah. 68 re yeah. revolution. Yeah. So they were in the middle of it. And, uh, so they were, yeah, they were, they were students at Paris's universities. Yeah, uh, when we were very young. Yeah. yeah. So and and so you were like four or five years old in '68. That's 68. right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, did they uh, leave France after that? Or no, no. We all left France in about in '77. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So and, and and what was your father's profession? I mean, even if he was a hippie, so he, he had to make money. So well, that's the thing. <laughs> Uh, he, he studied as a pharmacist, mm -hmm. he also studied philosophy, and eventually he ended up doing mostly um, working the arts and theater and the scene uh, the, and, uh, and not making a lot of money. And, uh, and, and my mother, she studied in economics and she, she worked all kinds of jobs, but, but eventually worked also in the same in the same field, uh, helping artists, basically managing artists. And what what took the family then to Morocco? Is that right? No. So, so my parents were born in Morocco. Oh, mm. okay. And in a way, my brother and I are really lucky to have been among the few in this country and many other poor countries who ended up being raised and, and born in, in rich countries like France. And eventually, we moved to Canada. Uh, and I think we. We, we have a responsibility to look back at all these other people in, in developing countries who are not enjoying the privilege that we have here. Nice. But we did move to Morocco for a year for my father to do his military service. So, oh. so that's what okay. brought all of us there. Right. Right. But, but they had left Morocco. Yes, right. Uh, before, right. A few years before. We uh, just after the revolution. Right. A lot During of Jews, you know, left yeah. uh, Morocco. Early 60s. In the right. early 60s. Right. And, and actually a lot went to France and a lot went to Canada and the US and Israel. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know that history mm. very well. Yeah. And uh, so then your father went back uh, for his military service. He went back as a family. That's right. Yes. That's and, right. And after Morocco, oh, back to France. Back to France for yes. a few years, but uh, at some point, uh, they, we all decided together that it was good to immigrate in Canada to yeah. start a new life. Yeah. And, and was there a, a particular reason, the political climate in, in France? No, or? no. no. Um, there were, uh, I think it, they had this dream of going to the new world and uh, right. start right. over, yeah. and we had family already there, so it was uh, easier yeah. to immigrate yeah. in Canada. Wow. My well, grandparents were here. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Canada's fortunate. Yes. In that way. Yeah. And we, you. We're also fortunate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You came then to uh, to Montreal. Montreal. That's yes. right. Uh, and then. So I've been living in Montreal for forty odd years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and when did the interest in computer science or science generally? Ah, start? that's a really interesting question. Very early, because it, it, there's a it's not yes. independent events. No, no, of course. Together, we I think we were fascinated by the, the early small computers we could find, and we actually so 
early as teens, we yeah, we we went to the U.S. Uh, to buy our first computer together with money that we had been able to find because we were really not rich, and we bought our first uh, small computer, an Atari 800. And, oh, is that right? An Atari 800. Started playing together with it and understanding how it works, what kind of uh, program Pro we could do. Programming in basic. Like, oh, is that right? With so. um, the uh, programs being stored on tapes. There were no, not even discs. Yeah, that, there was yeah. before floppy disks. That's right. Yeah, it was the early days. <laughs> yeah, and and then uh, uh, from the Atari, then you went on to. Uh, we we both went into uh, studies in universities that were uh, computer related. So I did computer engineering and then computer science. Mm -hmm. And I did computer science from the beginning. I see. And yeah. I did University of Montreal, and Joshua did McGill. McGill, yeah. And uh, from that point, uh, w did your paths diverge, or or have you not always yet. not yeah. at this point? No, no. We actually actually converged first. Right. Oh. <laughs> that's that's where the neural net thing <laughs> yes. really came together. So in '85, I started my masters, yeah. and I read a few neural net papers, and I I started reading some uh, Jeff Hinton papers and yeah. the connectionists. Uh, in '86, the uh, the first really important book, uh, the PDP book, mm -hmm. came out, and uh, and all of that was transformative for me. And it, it really, I fell I fell in love in with with AI and with neural networks research, trying to both understand um, the brain and intelligence and build intelligent machines. Yeah. And on my side, after my master, I. I I was looking for something to do, and Yasha was telling me about neural nets, and I started a PhD uh, in '89 in neural wow. nets. At that time, there was actually nobody in my university doing anything like that. So, although I found a, a, a supervisor, I, I worked mostly with Yoshua on trying to find an interesting research. And we had several really cool papers then. Is that right? What yeah. was the first so big, big in paper? Fact, the, so the topic of, of my thesis is that we jointly. Uh, discussed uh, was uh, about something that is now called AutoML. So it's something that learning uh, to learn, learning yeah. to learn that yeah. was not a big thing for 25 years, but in the last two to three yeah, years, now it came is. suddenly yeah. to be very important. Of course, when we worked on it 25 years ago, it was uh, much smaller. And, but and I think we didn't have the computational power to yeah. really execute yeah. on these ideas. Right. I think most of the ideas were there. It's just that we did not exploit them as much as we can now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, both b the computational power and the data, right? Yes. But for this, it was mostly the computational power. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. For the success of deep learning, the data was necessary, yeah. and that came only much yeah. later. Yeah. What, what drove you to stick with neural nets uh, during that winter that everyone well, talks about? I'm kind of stubborn, and <laughs> <laughs> I believe in my own vision, and uh, I, um, I thought everybody was wrong, and I was right, you know? Yeah. And um, some people, I think another reason is I had a few friends who believed the same thing as me. Yeah. Like Jan and Jeff. Yeah. And that made a whole world of difference because yeah. when you have a support network with CIFAR that eventually formalized this. Right. It, it really helps uh, to keep you psychologically, you know, into the, the direction you've chosen. That's right. There are clearly more things to learn and more things to understand in, in this field and so there's no there was no need to to change and to to do like everyone we could yeah. keep working on that and as long as people another important thing as far as i'm concerned is in canada the government for many decades has been investing in um curiosity-based funding of research yeah right? so you didn't have to do something that would have an application that was clear and uh, so I, I got reasonably well funded even through the hard times even when it was not fashionable I would say one of the reasons of the success of Mila the, the institute that, that I, I founded and of the group that you know I've been leading is the importance we give to freedom to yeah. you know letting people explore what they want and at the same time a lot of collaboration and uh, Collegiality, and you know, it, 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 these are the values of uh, scientific research, which which allow to go to do more than incremental progress. At what point uh, did did you start to to diverge? So, I, after I finished my PhD and did a few postdoc, I decided to 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 
accept a position of research scientist in Switzerland, where there was a small research lab that could that let me do, keep working on neural nets and do the research I wanted to do. Uh, and I think it was also I felt it was important to to maybe go somewhere else than staying with Joshua because you want to explore new colleagues, yeah. new new ways yeah. of thinking. Uh, right. That's how research works. Right. And so it was very important to go somewhere else. And yeah. that lab was uh, small but very interesting. And I could uh, uh, have PhD students and uh, get funding. Switzerland is very easy to get funding. So you could do your research. We had enough uh, compute power. So it was all good. And so on my side, I started working on keep working on the same topic and more, but in Switzerland. Yeah. While still working together, we actually had a PhD student that was first my PhD student, then became his PhD student, then came back and became <laughs> my PhD student. <laughs> and that's great. And that person has a very nice uh, career now, so he's yeah. working oh, on Facebook. Yeah. And so. yeah. <laughs> this is now, when you were in Switzerland, were what years? Uh, 99 to uh, 2007, I think. Okay, and then you joined Google. And then I joined Google in California, yeah. yes. And that was kind of a big uh, moment in each of your careers, uh, in that you did not join Google, <laughs> and <laughs> that right. you did join Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the reason I, I joined Google, so I, I was able to keep working on my research, there was no yeah. difference. The difference was the, the attraction of, at that time, I would say uh, access to more data, yeah. which was what uh, I thought was important at that time, and uh, and and access to more compute power to actually develop and consider machine learning models that could uh, work on bigger problems. Yeah. yeah, that was the attraction point, and also I was told that I could do my own research without uh, having to uh, work on product if needed. But as long as I could have impact, I said that sounds like a good deal. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and and Yashua, you've been very outspoken about why you did not go into industry, uh, and but that's a serious concern because uh, companies like Google are absorbing uh, the best and the brightest, and mm -hmm. it's leaving the universities. Uh, there's there's a bottleneck for training the next generation, right? Yeah. Which are the professors who can supervise the next grad yeah. students. So there's a bottleneck in that regard, but also uh, Google has the data, or not only Google, but, but industry yeah. has the data. They have the compute, uh, and academia is left with much less uh, ah, data. Academia, academia has the students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the boundaries are much more uh, um, subtle than that today. Uh, we can find a lot of data everywhere. We can find a lot of compute power everywhere. And we have research scientists that are both on, in academia and in industry. I think the things have been, it's not one or the other. You can do both if, if yeah. that's what you think is the it's best. A, it's a gray zone uh, now. There's also industry places where you do more applied work. Uh, so you actually only work on things that are useful for the company short term. And there are industries that are looking further because maybe they have enough money to be that to do that and so they actually do research that looks similar to academic research where they think f further they also publish their work so the the distinction is by far not black and white right and and it continue on. right google also or companies like google are funding institutes they gave quite exactly. a bit of money to miller right. recently right. they they see that it's a two way thing where everybody can benefit and yeah. Uh, yeah and does that make a difference uh for you to get that that kind of funding, sure. The, but the, the vast majority of our funding is government. Still. It's still government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, it, it, do you think that will change over time? That industry will will see the need to to keep the research institutes. Well, for now, the well industry funding is only increasing as mm -hmm. as the interest in, in deep learning and AI is is booming like crazy. Yeah. So, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, yeah. what is important is to keep a strong base of uh, government funding because that's generally more stable. Uh, industry can go up and down. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you... Uh, I ahead. was about to say, when I started at Google, um, I don't think the industry was interested in the kind of research that, say, Yoshua is doing or even what I was doing. Uh, I could yeah. do my research, but it didn't have the impact that it has today. So it, it changes because suddenly the industry sees that it actually works for solving their problem and they also think that they need to understand more so that they will solve their problem of tomorrow 
so today there's a big funding tomorrow we don't know and we'll yeah. see how it goes yeah uh, on on the 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 research uh you've been involved in in uh, neural nets uh Supervise uh, learning has has been very well explored at this point. Right. Do you see uh, where do you see the the future? I mean, a lot of people now are talking about uh, we we need to go, to go into unsupervised right. learning or and, reinforcement and learning. reinforcement learning. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you have uh, a project at Mila, the 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 baby AI project. The baby AI project, exactly. Baby which is uh, not baby anymore. Uh, well, we so we, we had a first version <laughs> like <laughs> six years ago. That's it. Um, and the, the the techniques were not ready. And today we have something, but 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 it also showing that the current level of uh, understanding of the world that the best machine learning systems have is completely insufficient to do things that are very, very easy for even babies. Yeah. And so the good news is you don't need like huge data from mm -hmm. Google or Facebook or whatever to explore those problems. There are lots of really hard problems that you can explore in toy environments uh, that can be simulated fairly cheaply. So that's what w that's one of the things we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of conceptual questions in machine learning and even theoretical questions that academia can handle without having huge means. That being said, at Mila, we're very lucky because we've been extremely well funded. So compared to other labs in the world, um, in, in, in academia, we're, we're doing quite well in terms of equipment. And, and in terms of data, you know, there's a lot of data that is out there for free. You can, you know, anybody can, can go and, and gather web pages from, from the net. And um, there's lots of public data sets that scientists use. Even people in industry use those data sets because they want to be able to compare their no. algorithms with uh, other researchers from uh, the community. Right. Right. So are, are you both going in that direction away so, from so supervised let me, learning? Let me start by saying that deep learning the phrase deep learning and the, the ideas there uh, really came about um, with unsupervised learning methods. So unsupervised le me learning methods were the first ones that allow us to train deep networks. Mm -hmm. And then around 2010, 2011, there, you know, there was a switch where we realized that we could, in fact, thanks to some work we did in, in my group, um, we could we didn't need these unsupervised learning techniques. We could train directly supervised models that are very deep. And, and then the industrial applications started you know, coming very quickly with computer vision, speech recognition, machine translation, and you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, but, 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 it, but it's not going to be enough for human level AI. Like humans don't need that much supervision. That's right. Um, and I think also. Uh, it's not just supervised and unsupervised. There's m yeah. multiple things in the middle. There's uh, self-supervised. There's uh, uh, reinforcement learning for sure. There's uh, many ways to get supervision cheap uh, from the data you already have. Uh, so it became a much more complex uh, space, I think. But what links all of that is more about uh, how do you tr represent the data in a better way so that it can actually solve some task, either the one you have at hand or further later so representation learning is actually becoming more the central well uh, we created a, a, a conference uh, Jan Lecker and I created a conference called international conference on learning representations because yeah. we thought that the the crux of deep learning was about representations and how you learn them and and still today and for many years this is gonna you know yeah. become a central question in AI yeah exactly uh, and tell me a little bit about uh, the, the headline <laughs> of your latest research. Uh, so I have a few uh, posters this year at uh, NeurIPS. Um, say, um, have one, for instance, that's trying to understand better uh, some of these uh, internal representations. Can we compare them? Uh, if we train multiple models that try to solve the same task, uh, do we get different representations? Can we measure some something between them? Uh, if you change the task, uh, do you get a different type of metric or distance between them? So really trying to, to peek a bit at the, the internals of, of what's trained when you train them. Um, that I think is, uh, it's, it's what interests me today is not just 
developing a new algorithm, but more just trying to understand what's currently going on and what are the limits. I'm also fascinated, not particularly by the by uh, the dangers of adversarial uh, training, but more about what it says about our understanding of, of training neural networks, our, our, our poor understanding of what works and what doesn't. So uh, again, it's about understanding. That neural nets are, are in fact very fragile. They are in fact fragile, so we might not learn the functions we think we learn. Exactly. Yeah. And certainly they're not working in a way that's um, uh, they're working in a way that's very different from uh, humans. So they they prob uh, they seem to have a very superficial understanding of of the underlying causes that humans understand, and instead they, they capture low level clues that work well on the training data or even the training distribution, like the test data. But when you then take those trained systems and you show them something like adversarial examples which are weirdly modified or you bring them to a different types of uh, for example you train in one city and you, you yeah. test them in a different country uh, often it doesn't work that great um, and but humans are very good at that kind of generalization which is right. across different uh, types of distributions, really. Yeah, yeah. I just had a fascinating conversation with a guy named Julian Tagelius at NYU, who uses video games, and he talked about this problem that that neural nets are are trained on a specific instance. They become very good at that instance, That's but right. you mm -hmm. change yes. even the 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 lighting, for example, aspect yes, ratio, the images. lighting, and they yes. break down. Yeah. Because yeah. in fact, there are no neural nets that at this point can really generalize is that right no no they Depends do what we they mean, mean by generalize yeah, so they do generalize to yes. examples that are Similar. from the same distribution so yeah. they're like let's say we collect images in the same setting in the same city um it will work if you if you collected data for a whole year and then you know the next year you can use it in around the same places it's going to work quite well mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing but uh, may maybe if you've been doing this in California and then you want to use your network in Montreal, the weather is so different, if you're building self-driving cars, for example, that you're going to be in trouble. And yeah. it generalizes enough that we can actually do real applications, like yeah. recognizing objects on photos that were never seen before that, right. that works. So yeah. as long as the photos are similar to the ones that were used yeah. for training, so but that's still enough to do something yeah, useful. Yeah, and so if you're a company and you yeah. want to build a system that's going to be robust, well, you're going to train it in many different yeah. places, for example. Yeah. And uh, you're going to use all kinds of techniques to make to show to the network the kind of uh, variations uh, deformations that uh, could happen so it could yeah. be robust to these things but we shouldn't be fooled by the fact that it works uh, for what we do today we investigate for when it doesn't work because that's of where course. we should go yeah that's, that's more why important it's not just saying oh it seems to work yeah let's try to understand w when it doesn't work and why and yeah. what's missing is it just data is it algorithms yeah. is it limitations that we just can't uh, solve yeah. i think these are there's been enough done in the research institutes that it's going to take decades to implement and 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 for it to work through the economy. No, uh, no you I don't think, it's think much so. Faster oh, is that right? Yeah. You know, with the the kind of um, uh, new libraries that uh, are now available, the, the it's it's very quick, and we see it in companies like Google, but Facebook does the same. To go from uh, an idea that is implemented in a very simple uh, framework to to go in like a matter of a few months to a product that is actually used by uh, millions of people. Yeah. So well I want to mention, because he's talking about libraries, that w we have an interesting connection there. Because I started a library called Theano, and uh, with, with, of course, my students uh, who did most of the work. Uh, and he started a library called Torch, Torch which was descendant is now PyTorch. And, and he's been involved in uh, TensorFlow, which is uh, inspired it, it, by inspired Tiano. a lot by Tiano. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. But that's how science proceeds as well. We, yeah. we get inspired by each other's work. Yeah. That's right. But it's not often. It's within a family. <laughs> that's right. You know. That's, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, are your parents still still with yes. us? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They must be Prom amazed. Yes. Yes. My mother especially. Yeah. <laughs> Can they? Do they understand any of this stuff? Uh, high level, I think. They, yeah. they, they understand that it's uh, 
highly mediatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. they get to see a lot of it. Well, but it's it's more than the reason yes, it's mediatic. I think they're very proud of our work as yeah, well. It's mm. it's transformative. So, that's right. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any futurist vision? I mean, I, I people hate to talk about AGI. And, yeah. So but, so I think that there is. Uh, a responsibility for researchers like us to not just do our very important research, it's very technical, but also think about how what we're doing is starting to have an impact in society and that we can play a role in, in how this is going to unfold. That we have a voice, we have um, some authority because where we are in our careers and that we, we can um, participate in, in the debate in our society about what do we want to do with, with AI, with, with this technology. Protecting it's, it's data. Not just, it's not just data privacy. Mm -hmm. There are like really ethical questions involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, that is why in Montreal, we've, we at Mila uh, have been working with philosophers and economists and, and, and legal people and medical people uh, to develop what is called the Montreal Declaration for mm -hmm. the Responsible Development of AI. It has 10 principles and uh, 60 sub-principles and, 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 and uh, a lot of um, uh, thinking and, and um, trying to articulate how, you know, what, what we should do with this technology and what we should not do. And I think it's, it sounds like easy but it's not and it's these ethical principles are going to come sometimes in contradiction with mm, like the, the 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 desire to sell more products or um uh, some military ambitions right so so ethics is about we trying to reconcile opposite values and, and objectives and where we have to find the right balance so stating these things and 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 making sure that there's a real rational discussion about them is very very important I'd like to uh, to add as well that the uh, companies are also very imp interested in that and like uh, a few months ago Google for instance uh, also uh, worked on uh, their uh, AI principles which basically state about the same what we can do what we shouldn't do what what are the positive things that AI can do, and what are the negative things that we should be careful about and not work on, or uh, not favor when we have a choice to to do? That's right. But so, but algorithms once they're created and released into the wild, yeah. uh, can't be. Sure. We're also for open science, so it's <laughs> yeah, and and you know, and, and no, I I disagree. Okay. So think about the. Um, uh, uh, airplanes and, and airlines, right? Um, they are under very strict regulations because governments have, re have realized that they need to regulate and, uh, you know, provide a common playing field for all the companies, even though it costs them something to, to deal with all those security issues. At the end of the day, it's better for everyone for, for of course the passengers and and uh, for all the companies that there's an international agreement about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and I think something like this needs to happen for AI as well even if yeah it is possible to build a plane that will crash and kill the people um, it's not allowed and uh, governments enforce those common rules yeah yeah it's a long, long debate. I yes, won't get yes, into it. Yes. But it's uh, never going to be perfect. Yeah. Right? There will be rogue states. There will be rogue companies. Yeah. But if we at least uh, have a consensus on what is right and what is wrong, then um, we can do things like you know certify products. We, we yeah. do this in many fields. Yeah. There's no reason why we couldn't do it in AI as well. Yeah, that's right. I guess it's the rogue. It's the hacker community those are the things that i worry but about but that's always possible think about any industry right well, somebody can take uh, progress in chemistry and, and use it to kill people but that's yeah. criminal that's you know yeah right mm -hmm. uh, 
the uh, so so AI general intelligence is not something or artificial general intelligence is not is, 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 is not around the corner that's yeah. not tomorrow yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. not no, it, it, it is in my mind but more like um, an objective because that's that's what yeah. I'm after right yeah but I also realize we are probably very far from it yeah in in your lifetimes what do you hope to achieve you know I'm <laughs> always after understanding yeah like every day that my understanding of the things I'm studying improves, it makes me feel good. And I don't have a crystal ball, but, <laughs> but I will, I'm going to continue trying to understand. Right. And Sammy? Same. Same. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. And you're going to see each other more often. Uh, we try. Well, <laughs> we he comes uh, to Montreal every Christmas. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. We yeah. also see each other at many conferences yeah. that we either call. The main places we, we meet are the conferences. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's amazing. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, I think I've probably run out of <laughs> semi-intelligent <laughs> <All right>. questions. <laughs> so, yeah. It was okay. great. I really Thanks. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yeah.